be joint work uh, with my colleagues from TU Graz and also from TU Darmstadt. Some of them are here. Okay, so what is my work about? It's called Timber 5, which brings enclaves, this SGX enclave concept, to small embedded RISC-V architectures. So what's the motivation? First of all, we want to protect secret code and secret data uh, depicted here as uh, treasure. And if you have a look at a traditional software stack, we have on the low end uh, potentially a hypervisor, then on the top an operating system and application, but we are running on top of this a small isolated container, which is called Enclave. And we are interested in protecting code inside such an Enclave, even if the whole uh, other software stack is compromised. Yeah, so there's a pretty cool technology called Intel SGX, which unfortunately has certain disadvantages. It's pretty closed. So we are looking here at uh, the RISC-V architecture. In case you haven't heard of it, it's an instruction set architecture which is completely open, so you don't have to pay any licensing fees. And it's not only uh, uh, academic work, but also more and more industry uh, collaborations are appearing here. And yeah, we want to use uh, this RISC-V and bring SGX features to small embedded RISC-V processors. And what do I mean by embedded? I'm talking here about small processors, small microcontrollers like the ARM Cortex M series, which only feature physical memory but no virtual memory. Okay, uh, to give you some background about enclaves, uh, as said before, we want to achieve secure code execution, which is uh, protected against malicious applications, but not only applications, also against malicious operating systems, potentially against malicious hypervisors. Okay, you don't have hypervisors on a small microcontroller but also against malicious other enclaves on the same system. So essentially, what we want to do is we want to protect an individual enclave from all other untrusted code on the system. And what this gives us is it minimizes the trust. You only have to trust this single enclave and the hardware for providing your security guarantees. Okay, uh, there's uh, quite a lot of work on uh, such secure execution architectures. There's a uh, sanctum on larger RISC-V with MMU support. Um, but we are focusing on embedded here, um, and the problem with existing approaches is that they are kind of inflexible. Uh, the isolation boundaries cannot change as dynamically as we want to have it. And uh, the problem here is also memory fragmentation. So what is memory fragmentation? If we look at small systems, we usually have only a limited physically linear address space, and we have to fit all applications into this physically address space. So, for example, if we run a process, we assign it the data and the stack segment. And if we run an enclave alongside this process, we need a separate data and stack segment. And as you can imagine, if you run another process with an enclave, you soon fill up your whole address space and you're out of memory. And the problem here is that most of the time, uh, the, uh, the data and stack segments might be uh, badly utilized. So, what we want to have instead is that an application and the enclave which belongs to this application can share the same segments. They should be able to share the same stack, for example, but in a secure way. And so we want to have this tight interleaving of memory between secure enclaves and unsecure applications. And uh, with this approach, we uh, can utilize the memory much better. And this brings me to my contribution here, uh, which is called Timber 5. And essentially, as said before, we bring enclaves to the embedded RISC-V architecture, and we do so by using a technique called tagged memory, which is a novel way of building enclaves. And uh, as already hinted before, what this gives us is a novel uh, stack sharing concept. So as shown on the right here, we can use a single stack for an application and an enclave and uh, tightly interleave the data of both components in the same stack. Yeah, there are other contribution, uh, contributions here, and uh, I'll invite you to read the paper for uh, getting an overview of all of it. And yeah, we also have a proof of concept in software. Okay, uh, let's uh, take an overview over Timber 5. Uh, in Risk 5, we have uh, classically user mode, U mode on top for running applications, and below we have supervisor S mode for running an operating system. And Risk 5 has a special execution mode called M mode, machine mode for Example, you can use it for emulating missing features like floating point instructions. And we extend this whole uh, concept via a vertical split 
This is quite similar to trust zone. So on the right hand side, we have the trusted domains. But on the other hand, uh, compared to trust zone, we achieve much higher, uh, uh, much finer granularity, and we have much higher flexibility in changing uh, this isolation boundary at runtime. So uh, alongside each ap application, we can have an enclave in user mode, in trusted user mode, TU mode. And on the low right side, we have uh, tech rules. Uh, and tech rule is responsible for maintaining all our security guarantees. So all the security logic is inside there. And you always have to have it somewhere. In SGX, for example, it's implemented in microcode. And we do this in software here. OK, and we consider all the application and the operating system as compromised, and even maybe some en enclaves are. Um, compromise and try to attack our benign enclave A in this case. Okay, uh, now let's think about how do we build enclaves? What do we need? What are essential building blocks in order to build an enclave? First of all, memory isolation. This is kind of obvious. We need to prevent others from accessing enclave memory. Second, we need secure entry points such that an enclave can only be entered at certain well-defined points defined by the enclave programmer. And this prevents uh, certain classes of code reuse attacks. And finally, we need to uh, identify enclaves. This is called attestation and also sealing for uh, deriving cryptographic keys from an enclave. And we need efficient ways to do inter-enclave communication in a secure way. Okay, let's start, with, uh, let's start with the first one, memory isolation. Uh, traditionally, on small systems, you use a memory protection unit, an MPU. And the memory protection unit lets you define contiguous blocks of memory, so-called memory regions, shown in blue here. And the problem with this approach is that you are certainly limited uh, in the number of regions you can define. That's dependent on the size of the MPU. And this creates kind of inflexibility. So on the other hand, there's another technology called tagged memory. What is tagged memory? So if we have a physical uh, memory depicted here, we have additional memory tags stored alongside the normal data. And these memory tags can be used for storing metadata, which are normally inaccessible to the normal application logic. And we can use uh, these memory tags to uh, specify uh, uh, certain memory ranges as belonging to process A, for example, or process B. So we can assign different colors to different applications. And that way, we can enforce certain uh, isolation between applications. But the problem with tagged memory is that the memory tag sizes can grow pretty large. So if you want to support enough enclaves, you need to have large tags. And there are certain proposals which have 100% memory overhead, which is infeasible for such small systems. Yeah, so what we want to do is we combine the benefits of both. So we combine an MPU and tagged memory. We use the MPU to specify processes and within such an MPU region, the application is confined and cannot escape. And on the other hand, we use tagged memory for having a fine-grained uh, isolation boundary within one process. For example, you, here you see uh, that process A has an enclave A, which is tightly interleaved in the same memory range, in the same MPU region. Also, we can have enclave B in process B. Um, we use the same approach to also protect and define what is uh, stored in our tag root. So what is the security component here? And now uh, let's talk about which memory tags we actually use. So the first memory tag defines what is uh, normal memory, where you can execute as usual. Um, and normally, uh, normal memory cannot access enclave memory. And also, it is unable to access tag root memory. So this enforces the essential security guarantee we need to have in order to protect enclaves. On the other hand, enclaves are tagged with TU, trusted user tags. And an enclave can very well uh, access normal memory. So this is used for exchanging data between an enclave and an application. And what's also important here is that an enclave can very uh, easily change tags here. By issuing a single store instruction, an enclave can switch tags between N and TU. This is uh, then our essential uh, feature which we can use for stack sharing. But an enclave can obviously not access this higher privileged uh, tag root memory. 
Finally, we have uh, TS uh, for trusted supervisor memory, which is used for tag rules. And this is kind of the guard mode, which is able to access any other memory and also uh, changing memory tags at will here. Okay, let's step back. We now uh, have the memory protection unit define our application boundaries from those blue boxes here, and within those blue boxes, we use these fine-grained memory tags to distinguish between application and enclave memory. And we have the same distinction also for the operating system and for attack root. Okay, we achieved our first goal. Let's go on to the entry points. Um, as said before, it's important to specify which entry points are allowed. And we do this with a fourth tag called trusted callable. And this trusted callable tag defines where an application can enter the enclave. And the way we do this is pretty easy. As soon as the CPU fetches from a TC tag, it knows that it has to switch to enclave memory, to an enclave execution mode. And this gives us zero runtime overhead. You can do a simple jump to the inside and to the outside. As soon as uh, the enclave jumps out again to normal memory, the CPU switches back to normal mode. And we do the same also for the operating system, which can uh, request certain uh, security features from tag root by entering a TC and exiting again. Yeah, and you can see now uh, that we in total use four different memory tags, and for this we only need two tag bits to distinguish those cases. And uh, on a 32-bit system, this yields a total memory overhead of only 6.25% for the physical memory, which is pretty low compared to other solutions. Okay, let's move on. Um, at the station and ceiling. Uh, as said before, we uh, have the root of trust in privileged software called tag root. And with this model, we can uh, achieve both uh, SGX and trust zone uh, kind, kind of uh, yeah, software stacks. SGX is uh, known for having an application and an enclave closely tied together. And for trust zone, you can also have standalone trustlets. We support both with Timber 5. And uh, this tag root is responsible for setting up all the MPU regions and ensuring that MPU regions do not overlap, such that enclaves are protected against each other. Also, this tag root sets up the initial tag bits for the enclave. And uh, with Timber 5, we have uh, a pretty uh, neat way to exchange data between enclaves. Um, for other approaches like SGX, you need heavy encryption between enclaves to exchange data. Other approaches use copying, but we use direct shared memory. So two enclaves can open up shared memory and uh, exchange data without copying overhead. And this involves mutual authentication. So in the end, both enclaves know with whom they are talking to. And this gives us local attestation for free. So we do not need a, se a separate step for local attestation here. And finally, we support ceiling. This is uh, quite similar to SGX. And it works like this. When TechRoot runs a new enclave, it first hashes the enclave code and computes an identity. And later on, uh, the enclave can request a ceiling key from TechRoot, which is derived from this identity. And the ceiling key is uh, unique to the enclave. It can be used for storing sensitive data offline, for example. Okay, now we have essentially all building blocks which we need to build enclaves. Let's uh, see what we can do with it. As hinted before, we have this novel stack sharing concept. And if you have a look here, uh, an application and an enclave can use the same single stack because you have a single execution thread which just sw uh, jumps between application and enclave. So for example, the enclave, uh, the application can store data on the stack which is tagged as normal memory, and tag. Now, if the application jumps to the enclave, the CPU will see this TC, this callable tag, and switch to enclave execution mode. Now the enclave can uh, use the same stack to store trusted data on the stack. And in the end, if the enclave uh, leaves execution again and jumps back to the application, the CPU will see this end tag and switch back to normal application mode. Now this uh, secure keys are protected by hardware from access from the application, but still the application can use the same stack for storing other data. And this stack sharing uh, 
cannot be only done between an application and an enclave, but also between an enclave and between tag root. So essentially, we save two stacks. We do not need a separate stack for the enclave, and we do not need a separate stack for tag root. And uh, with this uh, kind of memory interleaving, we can do the same to also share heaps between an application and an enclave. This gives us additional benefits because if you do not need to maintain a complex malloc implementation inside your enclave, you can move it to the outside and thus reduce the complexity, reduce the trusted computing base inside the enclave and gain more security. Okay, this brings me already to the end. Uh, some of the key insights, we built enclaves for the first time with tagged memory and uh, this gives us very fine granularity and also high flexibility at runtime for changing tags very efficiently. And by combining this tagged memory with an MPU, a memory protection unit, we only need tiny two tag bits. A two bit tags, yeah. And one advantage of this is uh, we reduce memory fragmentation. We can have shared stacks, we can have shared uh, heaps on small systems. Uh, if you are interested, we have the whole code base online. So we did an integration in the instruction set simulator, uh, which is called Spike for RISC-V. We did a full implementation of the tech route. Uh, we integrated the whole system with free Archos, which is a popular uh, real-time operating system. We have GCC support and a lot of benchmarks, which you can have a look at, and it's open source. So have fun playing around with it. Thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. from Northeastern, I uh, have two questions. So the first is, how do you implement the tag memory? Do you reuse the existing feature or you, d you build it by your own? Um, we implemented this in the Ether simulator. So uh, oh. we didn't uh, build hardware on an FPGA, but on the Ether simulator. Because there are already a lot of uh, tag memory implementations out there and we didn't want to add just another tag memory. So you can use it with uh, any sort of tag memory implementation which can enforce isolation based on tag bits. Okay, uh, the next question is uh, how many processes you can support because MPU only support limited number of regions. Uh, you mean uh, runtime yeah. overhead? Yeah, the, the, um, the this, number of, yeah. Uh, this depends on which kind of tag implementation you're using. So we are evaluating this approach with different models. For one model we assume that you have a very stupid tag memory implementation for which you need a separate code fetch, uh, a separate fetch for each memory tag, then this gets, of course, slow. This is the blue here, uh, which has around 25% overhead. And if you have an optimized tag memory implementation, which caches tag bits in the CPU or in a separate uh, cache, tag cache, then you can get down to 2%, 2.6%. And here we are assuming that the tag memory has a 10% overhead in runtime. Yeah. Thanks. Suzaki from, uh, from ASD, so uh, do you know PMP? PMP, uh, physical memory protection on uh, disk five? Um, PMP. Yeah, wh what's the question? Uh, my, my, my question is, uh, I think it can, uh, 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 it is available to implement uh, Timber V on PMP. Ah, this would be interesting. Uh, I don't know, we can maybe, we can talk afterwards. Okay, after us. Yeah. Okay, if there's no more questions, let's thank uh, our speakers. Yeah. Thank you.